Hi, this is Neil Satin, the host of Relationship Alive. I just wanted to take a quick moment to say that if you find this podcast helpful, please consider making a donation to help support the podcast. You can do that by visiting neilsatin.com slash support or texting the word support to the number 33444 and following the instructions. And you can choose any level that feels right to you. Thank you so much in advance for your help in ensuring that this podcast can continue. I also wanted to mention that if you haven't picked it up yet already, you can grab my free uh, top three relationship communication secrets. These are communication tips that you can incorporate easily into how you communicate with your partner, and they're based specifically on things that will help you grow closer and more connected to your partner, even if you're communicating about something challenging. You can get that by visiting neilsatin.com slash relate or texting the word relate to the number 33444 and following the instructions. All right, on with the show. Hello and welcome to another episode of Relationship Alive. This is your host, Neil Satin. What if everything that you've been told about sex and desire was wrong? Or maybe not quite wrong, just missing really important bits of information that would help you understand the big picture. As it turns out, there's a lot that we've come to know through science about what turns us on and what turns us off. But this information is relatively new and hasn't quite made it out to the mainstream or the cover of Cosmo, at least not yet. So how do you know if what you're experiencing is normal? And what can you do to discover more about who you are as a sexual being and to find more connection and sex in your relationship without creating pressure on yourself or on your partner? Today's guest has many of the answers to these questions. Her name is Dr. Emily Nagoski, and she's the author of the New York Times bestseller, Come As You Are which John Gottman says is the best book he's ever read on sexual desire and why some couples stop having sex. Esther Perel also refers to Emily's work. So if John Gottman and Esther Perel, who at the moment come from different camps on the question of sexual desire, if they can agree on Emily Nagoski's work, then you know that she's done something truly magnificent. So there's going to be a lot to cover, and as usual, we will have a detailed transcript and action guide for this episode available to you at neilsatin.com slash normal, or you can text the word passion to the number 33444 and follow the instructions to get your copy. Emily Nagoski, thank you so much for joining us today on Relationship Alive. I'm so excited to talk to you. So let's start at the very beginning. Very good place to start. Exactly. Um, where where did this book come from for you? It's about desire and it's about understanding what makes us tick. And in particular, it's written for women and about women's sexuality, though there's so much relearning for men to do as well. And I'm wondering if you can just create our garden here for us for this conversation where did this book come from and why why was it so important for you to write it sure yeah i'd been teaching sexuality in some form in some context for at least 15 years uh, when i started teaching a class called women's sexuality at smith college smith is a women's college so i had a class of almost entirely women 187 of them uh, and smith students are not ordinary human beings smith alums include gloria steinem and betty Friedan and katherine mckinnon and my favorite julia child and so the very first day I'm teaching the anatomy class, of course, I just start with the anatomy and a student raises her hand and says, Emily, what's the evolutionary origin of the hymen? And 15 years I'd been a sex educator. I had never even wondered 
the answer to that question. So I knew it was going to be an intense, interesting semester. And it really was. They pushed me really hard. I shoehorned in as much science as I could into this beginner level class. Uh, So after a semester of really hard work, my last question on the final exam was, just tell me one important thing you learned. It can be just take the question seriously. You can have your two points no matter what you say. Just tell me one important thing you learned after all this cutting edge science. And I thought they were going to say the evolutionary theory or attachment theory or arousal nonconcordance or um, a responsive desire or any of these other things. And more than half of them out of 180, 187 extraordinary students, more than half of them just wrote something like, I'm normal. I learned that I'm normal. Just because I'm different from other women doesn't mean I'm broken. I can accept my sexuality as it is and my partners even when it's different from mine. And so I'm grading final exams with tears in my eyes thinking, I don't know what happened in my class, but I think it must have been something extraordinary. And I want to do it again. And I want to do it on a much bigger scale. And that's the day I decided to write Come As You Are. And it uh, five years after that is uh, when Come As You Are actually got published. And I love this. Uh, there are so many quotes from your book. And one thing that I really enjoyed about reading Come As You Are is that literally every chapter revealed something new. So while it all builds on itself at the same time, I felt like I was walking through a labyrinth and around every corner I found some amazing gem, which is just so exciting, you know, when you're reading a book. But this quote toward the end um, really was powerful for me. And all it is is this. The sexuality you have right now is it. And it's beautiful, even especially if it's not what you were taught it should be. Yeah. And that really hit me hard because I think so often we do get lost in thinking it's supposed to be some other way. And when we learn to tune in to what is actually happening in our bodies and accept that and then use that as the springboard for what happens next, there's so much power in that moment. And in one way, it's really obvious that the fastest, easiest way to shut down your sexual well-being is to judge and shame your own sexuality as it is? Like, is that going to be a turn on in your brain for you to hate what's happening in your sexuality? Obviously not. But if you can release the judgment and shame and be like, oh, look, here's my sexuality being what it is doing what it does. I know that I've been given a sort of like phantom sexual self of what I'm told I should be what I'm supposed to do what it's supposed to be like. And I know I'm supposed to beat the shit out of myself until I meet that standard. But what if what if just hypothetically, I stopped beating the shit out of myself and just enjoyed my sexuality as it is. It turns out our ability to stop demanding that our bodies be different and allowing them to be as they are is maybe the single most powerful thing we can do to maximize our sexual well-being. Is it easy? Nope. But it's almost magical in its power. And this might be a good time to start with talking about the dual control system. This is something that probably most people don't know about in terms of how they think about their own sexual operating system. So can you speak a little bit to what is the dual control mechanism and how does that affect whether we're into sex or not into sex or feeling desirous and aroused or not feeling desirous and aroused? Absolutely. So this is the fundamental hardware between our ears in the way our sexuality functions. It's a model developed at the Kinsey Institute starting in the late 90s, early 2000s by Eric Johnson and John Bancroft. And it basically posits that sexuality works the way every other system in our central nervous system works, which is a dual control mechanism. If there's a dual control mechanism, how many parts are there? Two. There's two parts. Exactly, right? So the first one is the sexual accelerator. And if for the first part, it's the accelerator or the gas pedal. The second part must be 
The brakes. Break, exactly. The accelerator is the part most of us are already sort of familiar with. So this response, it notices everything in the environment that it codes as sexually relevant. This is all the things that you're seeing and smelling and tasting and hearing and crucially imagining that your brain codes as a sexually relevant stimulus. And it sends that turn on signal that activates arousal and desire. But at the same time that that's functioning, there is also a break that is noticing all the good reasons not to be turned on right now. Everything you see and hear, smell, touch, taste, or crucially imagine that your brain codes as a potential threat, a reason not to be sexually active right now. And it sends the turn off signal. So your level of arousal or desire at any given moment is this balance of how many ons are turned on and how many offs are turned off. Sexual well-being is maximized. That is to say, sexual pleasure in the moment is maximized when you're turning on all the ons and all of the breaks are turned off. And when I was talking about self-criticism and contempt for your own sexuality uh, being a turnoff, Obviously, if you're judging your own sexuality, is that is that hitting the accelerator? Almost certainly not. That's one of the very common things that hits the brakes. Yeah, and I think what is confusing is that it's common for us to idealize one and to completely ignore the other. Or one thing that was really enlightening in reading about these is that we come with our own set level for these things. So some of us could have an accelerator that's really sensitive and easy to turn on, whereas others may not. And that doesn't necessarily represent a problem that needs to be fixed. Um, and same with the brakes. So maybe you could talk a little bit more about that and why that why that's so. Yeah, there, there are individual differences in the sensitivities of the brakes and the accelerator in each person's brain. It, as far as we can tell from the science so far, they seem to be pretty set. Um, they're not as set as IQ, but we don't know of any specific interventions to change their sensitivity. So let's just assume they're like personality traits, like introversion and extroversion. They are what they are. Most of us are heaped up around the middle. We're just sort of all about the same. But a handful of people, for example, will have really sensitive accelerators. And a person with a sensitive accelerator, vroom, right? That's a person who is easily activated, which can be great under the right circumstances and can be uh pretty dangerous under the wrong circumstances. Uh, if a person uh, is experiencing a lot of negative affect, stress, depression, anxiety, loneliness, helplessness, repressed rage, we've all got it. Um, and they don't have good mechanisms in place for coping with that negative emotion, they may begin to use sex as an outlet, a way to avoid experiencing those negative emotions. And that's where sexual risk taking and sexual compulsivity can come into play in those folks who have higher sensitivity accelerators. Um, and on the other end of the spectrum, there's the folks, for example, who might have uh, really sensitive breaks where the least stray thought, stray fingernail, stray noise in the hallway can just shut everything right down. And those are the folks uh, who struggle most with sexual dysfunction, uh, desire disorders, desire differential in their relationship. Um, for most of us, though, it's not that our breaks are overly sensitive. It's that we have just a, tr a truckload of stuff hitting our breaks all the time. And it's much more common. The usual party line about sexual issues is that, well, you should try adding more stuff to the gas pedal. Try role play and lingerie and toys and porn and fantasy and all the things. And those are great. And you should try them if you like them. Great. And most people, when they're struggling with sexuality, it's not because there's too little stimulation to the accelerator. It's because there's too much stimulation to the brake which is going to be some of it is that self-criticism and body shaming. For some people, it's a trauma history. For some people, it's straight up stress. 80 to 90 percent of people find that uh, stress and other mood and anxiety issues uh, negatively impact their sexual desire. For some people, it can actually increase it. Uh, but that's a different story. Um, and relationship issues, of course, are a major factor in things that hit the brakes. So what's a good way for someone listening right now to get a sense for themselves of what what we're talking about and how it impacts them? Like, how do I identify what my what my brakes are and what my accelerator items are? 
Yeah, most people have a good, and they just sit down and think about it, and you know, like, when people, I'm interested in sex when these things are happening, and I am not at all interested and don't experience pleasure under these circumstances. So you can start in a general way with just lists, like what are the things that stress me out that prevent me from being interested in sex? What are the relationship issues that like get me stuck so that when I get in bed with my partner, I'm not just getting in bed with my partner, I'm getting in bed with this like laundry list of crap that's just like gunking up the pipes um and you got to clean out the pipes before you're going to be interested in sex another concrete specific way rather than just generically is if you think about one really awesome sexual experience you've had it doesn't have to be the best one you ever had just like a really great sexual experience consider what the context was that might have been hitting the accelerator and keeping the brakes off. So what was your own mental and physical state? What were your partner characteristics? What were your relationship characteristics? What what was the setting? Was it in person? Was it in public? Was it over Skype? Was it texting and photos? Was it you know, like in the closet at a stranger's house at a party against a wall of other people's coats? Or was it in your own bed with the door shut and the kids over at somebody else's house? What was the setting that worked? Other life circumstances is a really important factor. How stressed out and exhausted were you from work? And, you know, impending nuclear holocaust. Like, what was your overall stress level? And then my favorite relevant factor is that called ludic factors. Ludic uh, related to the word ludicrous. It just means play. How curious and playful and fun could you be in the, like, what games were you playing with your partner that were really working for you. Um, so there's actually, if you go to my website, there's uh, worksheets. The worksheets are in the book and you can also just download them for free that walk you through these contexts. I recommend that you think through three great experiences and three not so great experiences, not three terrible sexual experiences, just three like meh kind of experiences and look for what wasn't working for you. Uh, and when you actually, it's a, it takes, you know, some time, but when you sit down and take the time to think through what contexts were really working for me to sit and actually think through six different sexual experiences, but people really do have surprising insights. People who really feel like they know a lot about their own sexual functioning when they sit down and think in this concrete, specific way will notice things they never heard before. A friend of mine went through it and what she realized, she's in a long distance relationship. And so when she actually did get together with her partner, what she noticed was that the expectation that now that we're finally together, we should be having sex, that expectation, that sense of obligation was absolutely the key to her shutting down her sexuality. And she only figured that out by thinking critically through the factors that were hitting the accelerators and hitting the brakes. Mm. Yeah. And that's huge. You, you talk about that particular one, like how you feel about whether you are or not having sex or how you feel about whether or not you should want to have sex in this moment as being another really important factor in whether your accelerator is on and your brakes are out of the way or your sexual car is coming to a screeching halt. <laughs> I'm curious to know um, from, yeah, from your perspective, one thing you just mentioned was the, the people who do have a really um, light touch accelerator and the danger for those people that sex could become a compulsion if it's that easy for them to to get turned on and to potentially use it as a way to mitigate and cope with the the stress and things that are going on in their lives and it's i in my experience with my clients and um people i talk to and in, in my own experience as well sometimes that those people tend to find themselves in relationships with people who do not have as light touch of an accelerator and in fact often have quite the opposite. So I'm wondering what what do you do and and I think part of this is maybe in what you were just talking about with that the 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 way that you think about whether you should or shouldn't be having sex but what do you do to give someone hope who is in a situation and you describe in your book um, one of the the amalgamated characters someone named Olivia a woman who is 
really it's really easy for her to get into the mood to have sex and she's with a partner named Patrick who for whom it's not so easy and um how do you give a couple in that situation some hope around shifting that dynamic in a way that that feels positive for both people so this actually touches on what has turned out to be one of the most important ideas in the book, which is the nature of desire itself, how desire is supposed to function in our bodies and our relationships. So in the case of Olivia, who is the composite character with a sensitive accelerator, she represents about 15% of women who have pretty sensitive accelerators. Uh, It means that she also happens to be a person who, when she is stressed out, her interest in sex actually goes up, which is true for, again, about 10 to 20% of people. Um, Um, And that is there's not a gender differential on that one. Uh, And she's with a partner, as so many of these folks are, for whom the opposite is true. So if they're both stressed out at the same time, Patrick's interest in sex hits the floor and Olivia's hits the ceiling. And that's not in and of itself a problem. But if they start having opinions about which one of them is doing it wrong, that's when things can get really tricky because it's If you don't have a judgment about who's right and who's wrong and you're just like, well, our brains are wired differently, that's how it is, and you can rationally negotiate a compromise, great. But if you start feeling bitter and resentful towards your partner for either being too demanding or too withholding and you're judging and shaming yourself for wanting too much and being too much or you're judging and shaming yourself for not wanting enough and not being enough, that's when things get really sticky, which is why the you are normal mantra comes back over and over in the book. You are normal. Nobody's doing it wrong. Both people are right and healthy and fine. The emotional weight that we attach to different experiences of sexual desire is just a social construct that we're laying on top of it. You get to feel, again, totally normal about the way you are experiencing desire. And the practical solution is just to negotiate. So what are we going to do about the fact that I would like to have the sexy sexes and you are not interested in having the sexy sexes right now? How about we compromise in some way that works for both of us where like you stay with me and put your hand over my heart while I masturbate to orgasm. That would that way you don't have to do anything you're not into and I get to have the connection and the sexual release. How's that sound? If we can let go of our judgments of what sex is supposed to be and what desire is supposed to be, that's a perfectly reasonable compromise. That's a really helpful compromise. It's only a not helpful compromise if you're like, but it doesn't conform with my expectations about the aspirational, culturally constructed ideal of what my sex life is supposed to be. (laughs) Right, right. And so this is great because I'm wondering if you can, can suggest a good way to notice that in oneself. Like, how do I know whether what I want is culturally constructed or what I actually want and what's would be really important to have on some level. Dude, I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, that's, that's the million dollar question, right? Um, I would say that the distinction we're thinking about here is not so much what I want versus how I feel. Mm. Um, So the word that I use in the book that comes from John Gottman's research is meta emotions. There's how you feel. There's how your sexuality. And this is also language I came up with after I finished Come As You Are. I was traveling all around the country and I was talking to students all over and a student raises her hand and says, you say in the book, Emily, confidence and joy over and over. You use these words, confidence and joy. Can you tell us what you mean by confidence and joy. And I was like, no, I have no idea what those (laughs) words actually mean. And I had to think about it for a long time. And I finally realized that confidence is knowing what is true, knowing that you have a sensitive accelerator and your partner doesn't, or you have a sensitive brake and your partner doesn't. Um, Knowing that the context that works for you is one that is really safe and familiar and calm and quiet, whereas the context that works for your partner is one of novelty and adventure and risk. And okay, now you know what's true. Joy is the hard part. And that's loving what is true. Even 
as I say in the book, when it is not what you were taught, it was supposed to be true. Even if it's not what you wish were true, boy, would things be simple if two partners always, all the time, wanted the same level of sex. Desire differential is the most common reason why people seek sex therapy. Desire differential is also literally universal. There is no such thing as two people whose desire tracks the same day to day. Sometimes you have a rough day and your partner doesn't, so you're not interested in sex and your partner is. Some days the opposite is true. There's no such thing as people with exactly the same desire all the time. So just like being like, hey, that's cool. That's what's true. Fortunately, I also love my partner. And so we're going to work it out together. We're going to have conversations that can be calm and loving and affectionate because we understand what's true about ourselves, about our accelerator, about the context that work for us. And we understand we love each other and the things that are true about our two different sexualities. There's no judgment. There's no shame. There's just accepting that we are two different people. And it's not just that people vary from each other. It's also that people change over time. So when you're in a relationship that, that lasts over multiple years, you and your partner's sexualities are going to change and they may not necessarily change along the same trajectories. Joy is loving what is true about both of your sexualities and the ways that they change, whether that feels comfortable and easy or not. And this conversation, I appreciate that you brought up the, the requirement to, as much as possible, having have it in a loving way. Because those desire differentials can create a lot of stress. And as you just mentioned, for most people, um, no matter where they are in terms of brakes and accelerator, um, I think somewhere between 80 and 90 percent of people, um, mm -hmm. that stress is going to <clears throat> is going to turn the brakes on. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about this, how the stress that we're carrying around with us every day, what can we do about that? Why is it so important to do something about it um, rather than just sweeping it under the rug or pretending it doesn't exist? Right. And, and what's on the other side of doing something about it? There's a whole lot of telling ourselves not to in a lot of aspects of our lives. We tell ourselves not to feel that way about sexuality. We try to force ourselves to feel a different way than we actually feel. We fight against the truth and reality. And we do that with our stress too. We tell ourselves that we're supposed to uh, experience, we're just, no, that I don't need to be stressed out about that. I can just, you, you try to tell yourself, relax, just relax. I mean, when your partner, if you're like stressed out and your partner's like, why can't you just relax? Just relax. Is that helpful? Does that help? Does that make things better? No, no it right. doesn't make things better, right? No, obviously. So what has to happen is instead of trying to just like not be stressed out, you have to move in the direction of the stress, sink down into it and allow your body to experience it. Stress is a physiological process. It's like digestion. It has a beginning and a middle and an end. And if we don't interfere with it, our bodies will move through that entire cycle in a healthy, normal way that doesn't interfere with our lives. But as human beings with giant prefrontal cortexes and massively social tendencies to want to like control our emotions in order to make other people feel good, we tend to keep the brakes on on our stress in the same way they keep the, our brakes on on our sexuality. And so we're walking around with all these activated stress response cycles. Stress is the adrenaline and the cortisol and the hypervigilance and the like muscle tension and the digestion changes and and the cardiovascular changes and like your whole body and your immune system is suppressed. Every body system is influenced by the fact that these stress response cycles have been activated. And if you just tell yourself not to feel it, those stress response cycles will stay spinning inside your body waiting to finish and they will wait forever. Most of us are walking around with decades worth of incomplete stress response cycles, like just like sitting like rocks somewhere in our body waiting for us to let them go. Fortunately, there's lots of research that tells us what the effective strategies are for completing the stress response cycle. For example, physical activity. This is the obvious one because um, the stress response cycle is designed for us to survive threats like being chased by a lion. When you're being chased by a lion, what do you do? Right, you get the hell out of there. You run, yeah. So um, 
our bodies do not differentiate between stressors. So your body responds basically the same way to a lion as it does to your boss or to your partner shaming and guilting you about sex, right? It's basically the same physiological stress response. Um, It turns out dealing with the stress itself, the physiology in your body requires basically totally different things from dealing with the thing that caused the stress. There is the calm, rational planning and negotiating that you have to do with your partner. And then there is the dealing with the physiological stress itself. Just because you've dealt with a stressor doesn't mean you've dealt with the stress. Mm. So physical activity is the single most important thing that you can do. Um, when people tell you that physical activity is good for you, that's that's for realsy every day, 20 minutes if you possibly can. Literally any form of physical activity, even if it's just like jumping up and down in your bedroom, any form of physical activity is helpful. Uh, we know that sleep is effective. Creative self-expression, writing and painting, uh, music, We know that sleep is effective. Did I say sleep already? Oh, and affection. Mm -hmm. Uh, So calm, trusting, especially physical affection, but it doesn't have to be physical affection. It can just be the loving presence of another human is great. You know, it's also great. The loving presence of a dog. You know, it's also great. Loving presence of a god. If that's what makes sense for you, like whatever counts as a loving presence for you, sitting and being with that presence helps to return your body to a state of calmness so that your body knows this is a safe place to live. I am safe right now. But it takes doing something for real, not just telling yourself. Right. And if you're doing that over and over, especially finding uh, a way to regulate with another, with your partner, Mm -hmm. Um, then that brings about its own level of healing in terms of your right brain coming back online and um, your ability to to operate from the parts of your prefrontal cortex that... Right, to think critically, to be curious and creative, all of that comes back only when you have reduced the adrenaline and cortisol levels and reduced the threat levels so that the creative t- creativity can expand instead of being so focused on just survival. Exactly. So um, just for your reference listening, if you want to learn more about healing trauma and ways, modalities that can help with that. We did have Peter Levine on the show, the creator of Somatic Experiencing. That was episode 29. So something for you to to bookmark and listen to later. And he'll be coming back on the show as well. But um, Somatic Experiencing is just one. There are, there are all kinds of modalities if you want to work with a practitioner to help you Pat unearth. Ogden is another really key person in body-based therapy. Mm. Pat Ogden and... Uh, somatic i forget what it's called but pat ogden is amazing and great and does really really good work around healing trauma through the body what i love about body-based strategies for dealing not just with stress but with trauma is that you don't ever have to have insight you don't even necessarily have to think about whatever it is that caused the stress or the trauma it's a different process you can choose an insight process if you want to but if you don't want to go there if you don't want to think about it sometimes you can release this shit from your body without ever having to think about the event that activated the stress. You can just deal with the stress itself without dealing with the event itself, especially if the event is in the past and there's nothing you can do about it now. Body-based therapies are a wonderfully gentle, indirect, tremendously effective strategy for helping to return your body to a safe state. Mm, big recommend from from me as well. Um It's basically, so there's a chapter on stress and love, Mm -hmm. and the stress section is pretty much entirely based on the polyvagal theory and Peter Levine's work, somatic experiencing, and Pat Ogden's work, and the the body-based approach to stress. Great. Yeah, and uh, if you want to learn more about the polyvagal theory, which Emily just mentioned, uh, check out our episode with Steve Porges, uh, which is episode number 34. So you've just interviewed my entire shelf of reference books. <laughs> Basically. That's my goal, Emily. I, you shouldn't have <laughs> sent me that photo of your bookshelf and actually send me more because I don't want to run out of people. Um, I'm curious if we can talk now about the... Because one of the concepts that you discussed that was so fascinating for me was how you broke apart um, 
the process of arousal and desire into these different systems in our brain. And there was the enjoying system, the mm -hmm. expecting system, and the eagerness system. And I, f I felt like taking it apart like that made it so much easier to understand in a way that's actually practical for people. So can we dive in and just give a little bit more information to our listeners about what I'm even talking about? Yeah. So when you read sort of mainstream popular science journalism about science, brain science, they'll refer to this thing, uh, the pleasure centers of the brain. And if they do that, it's a pretty good cue that they either don't know what they're talking about or they're simplifying it in a way that's really unhelpful because it's not just the pleasure center of the brain and calling it the pleasure center is like calling your vulva the vagina. Like there's so much more to it. And if we ignore the other parts, we are ignoring some just fundamental aspects of how the thing works. So if we break it down, yes, there's the pleasure part, which is just the part of your brain that responds to whether or not stuff feels good. And that's a little more complicated. We can talk about the ways that your brain responds differently to different stimuli is pleasurable or not, depending on the context. Should we do that now? Or sure. Should I wait? Yeah, let's. OK. And I'll bring us so back. Yeah, the pleasure piece of it is slightly complicated because uh, the nucleus accumbens shell uh, in your brain has an affective keyboard. Everybody's asleep now. Sorry. <laughs> so the deal is, if you're in a sort of a neutral mental state and somebody tickles you, meh. If you're already in a fun, flirty, sexy, positive, playful, trusting state of mind and you're a certain special someone tickles you, but even if tickling is not your favorite, in principle, like that could feel fun and lead to other things happening, right? Because your brain interprets that stimulation as something to be approached with curiosity and pleasure because you already feel safe and trusting and playful. But if you are, you know, pissed off at your partner and they tickle you, you want to punch them in the face. It's exactly <laughs> the same stimulation, right? The same tickling stimulation, but the state of your mind is different. Your brain state is different. And so your brain interprets the sensation entirely different, not as something to be approached with curiosity and pleasure, but as a potential threat to be avoided or even attacked. Right. And the only thing that is different is your state of mind. So pleasure is not simple. Pleasure is sensitive to the context in which you're experiencing it, which is why, you know, hot and heavy early on in the relationship, you're in the middle of making dinner and your certain special someone comes over and starts kissing on your neck or whatever. And your knees kind of get soft and you're like, oh, that's cool. And, you know, things happen. Ten years later, you're trying to make dinner and you've got kids waiting for food and screaming at you and you've got 10 years of accumulated frustrations in your relationship. Your certain special someone comes over and kisses on your neck then. You're like, I'm trying to go away from me. What are you doing? It's Again, it's exactly the same stimulation, but because the context is different, you experience that sensation in a totally different way. And that is a normal way for us to experience sensations. The problem is not the way we experience a sensation. The problem is that the context changed. And it's not that the context is broken. That's just life. There's always the solution. We don't have to change us in order to find a solution. We just notice what it is about the context that's hitting the brakes and making our brain interpret the sensation as something that makes you want to smack the person in the face and change the context, if you possibly can, to something that makes you interpret this person's sensations as something pleasurable to be approached with curiosity. So that's the pleasure component of it. The nucleus accumbens shell. Woohoo! The second part of this pleasure center is actually the uh, desire part, eagerness. I call it in the book. Uh, Kent Berridge, who's have you have you interviewed Kent Berridge? Not yet, no. Oh my God, that's that's the next guy on my shelf. Okay. Kent Berridge uh, or Morton Kringlebach. Okay. <laughs> they are the two key authors on this uh, batch of research that distinguishes between wanting and liking. We talked about what, what liking is and the ways that it's dependent on context. Wanting is moving toward, is the actual like activation, the desire approach piece of it. Not just the liking of like, woo, or blah, 
right? There's so, um, the classic example that I actually cut from the book. So this is the thing that you will not read in the book, just to differentiate between wanting and liking. In uh, an experiment they gave, I always imagine it as like one of those beer hats where like there's a bottle on one side and a bottle on the other side and straws going into your mouth. Do you know what I mean? Uh-huh. So they gave one of those to a rat. It's not really like that, but just imagine it's like that. And in one of the cans, there's sugar water, which is delicious to the rat. And in one of the cans with a straw going into the mouth, there's salt water with the salinity of ocean water. How does that taste? Salty. Yeah, it's gross. It's like, <laughs> no, but it's just a really innately disgusting flavor uh-huh. because it's a dangerous flavor. It will uh, give you way too much sodium and make you sick. Right. Um, so... They teach the rat that certain bells are associated with the sugar water coming in. When they they get the sugar bell, they get excited. Yay, here comes the sugar. And when the salt bell comes on, they go, ah, I don't want the sugar bell to go. I don't want the salt. Um, But then they give the rat a drug that reduces their salt level. Um, Now, so this is an animal that has zero pleasurable experience with the salty water. It's gross. They don't like anything about it. But when you deplete their salt levels, they will go over to the salt bell and start like pushing it and gnawing on it and try and be like, make this. They want the salt desperately because you've depleted. You have a sodium drive that makes you desperate for salt if you don't get it. If you don't have the right sodium levels, you can literally die. So their whole body is in this huge activated, I want the salt, though they have zero experience of liking the salt. Does mm-hmm. that distinction make sense mm-hmm. between wanting? So pleasure, liking is the pleasure part, enjoying. And then there's eagerness, there's desire, there's moving toward. And they are overlapping, certainly. But they are not identical, and it is really important that we distinguish it. And then the third component of this mechanism that we usually just call the pleasure center is uh, 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 it's associative learning is basically what it is. When I do PowerPoint presentations, I represent it with a drooling bulldog mm-hmm. because of Pavlov's dogs, right? right. You train them to drool with the ring of a bell. All you do is you put food in front of a dog, it automatically starts drooling, and you ring a bell. Food, bell, drool. Food, bell, drool. And eventually you just ring the bell, and that's all it takes to get the dog to start drooling. Does that mean that the dog wants to eat the bell? No, of course not. Right. Yeah, of course not. Of course not. Does it mean that the dog finds the bell delicious? No. Of course not, right? It just means that the bell has been made food relevant. It's associated with food stimuli. So it's now a food relevant stimulus. Mm. Our genital response, blood flow and all the rest of that is the associative learning component where if you're presented with a sexually relevant stimulus, you will get genital response. This is your activating, this is a sexually relevant accelerator response. It turns out there is a not very relevant overlap. There's not much of an overlap between what counts as a sexually relevant stimulus and what is actually liked, particularly in heterosexual women. Um, So that a person's body can respond to sexually relevant stimulus. In the research, it's almost always different kinds of porn. Sometimes it's visual porn. Sometimes it's like they're being read an audio book of of an erotic story. Uh, Sometimes uh, they're even watching bonobo chimpanzees copulating, right? And women's genitals will respond to this, not as much as to the human porn, but significantly above baseline. If their genitals are responding, does that mean they find the bonobo sex like they really want to have sex with the bonobos? Does this that is, mean they like This is so sex? important. This is like one of the things in your book that not about bonobos necessarily, but <laughs> <laughs> but this question of how does our genital response correlate to our actual desire? And this might be a great time to talk about non-concordance. Right. And for a lot of people, the answer is it doesn't, particularly for women. There's about a 50% overlap between genital response and perceived arousal or subjective arousal in cisgender men and about a 10% concordance 
overlap between genital response and a subjective arousal in heterosexual women. One of the pieces of research that's come out since Come As You Are was published is the distinction that uh, this arousal nonconcordance appears to be a factor really just in straight women. We have no idea why there is a difference in sexual orientation, why there's a difference in gender. It doesn't matter why there's a gender difference. We do have this tendency, like is anybody sitting here thinking right now, Really, there's that much of an overlap for guys. What's the matter with men? There must be, I mean, that's so strange that they have so much concordance between their genital response and their subjective desire. What's going on with that? No, everybody automatically thinks, really, women's 10% overlap. That's really, what's wrong with women? That's, you know, the patriarchy. That's the androcentric model of sexual desire, arousal, and response that all of us got raised in, assuming that the way a man works is the way a woman is supposed to work. And the extent to which a woman differs from a man is the extent to which she is broken and needs to be fixed. And that's just not true. When a person's genital response doesn't overlap with their perceived arousal, when their genitals are responding and they're like, nope, not doing it for me. What that means is that they've been presented with a sexually relevant stimulus that they do not want or like, which we can only understand if we know that this pleasure center of the brain does have these three separate channels that interact of sexual relevance, sexually pleasurable, and sexual desire. They're related to each other, but they don't necessarily overlap. And we live in a pretend, in a fucked up enough culture that we're presented with plenty of sexually relevant stimuli in contexts where we neither want nor like what is happening. Right. And I would think that another way of looking at the statistic for men, the 50% concordance, is that men have the potential to be victimized by their sexual, by their, their genital arousal, basically. Like, yes. That. Yeah, this narrative shows up a lot in stories of uh, sexual violence against people of every genital configuration. The typical model is um, a person with a vulva being sexually assaulted and the perpetrator says, well, but you were wet. So obviously you wanted it or liked it. I cannot tell you how many students have told me, oh my gosh, this explains that experience I had where I was like, eh, this isn't doing it for me. And my partner was like, no, you're turned on, you're wet. As, as though a person's genital response tells us more about what they're experiencing than the person does. And the same thing happens when a person has a penis. If blood is flowing to their genitals, they've been taught that that's an indication of who they are. Like their whole identity is tied to that. And it certainly indicates that they must want or like what is happening. But no, it's a reflex. We would never tell someone if they bit into like, you know, a wormy old apple. Well, your mouth watered when you bit into that wormy old apple. So you must have actually really wanted or liked it. Right? We would never do that. When your doctor taps your patellar tendon and your knee kicks out, nobody's like, I mean, but deep down though. You really wanted to kick your doctor. We don't. We don't make this assumption with any physiological reflex, except for genital response, and we do it no matter what a person's genitals are, and it perpetuates a lot of myths around sexual violence. Mm, yeah. In fact, I loved your rewrite of Fifty Shades <laughs> of Grey, <laughs> which I can quote here. She the ne in the next edition, Emily thinks that Grey should say to Anna. Instead of, because um, he, right, he spanks her and she gets wet is like yes, basically the consents kind of, to it. She yeah. doesn't want it. She doesn't like it. There is not a single word about pleasure. Her face hurts because she's squirming so hard to get away. And then Christian Gray, the spanker slash hero slash douchebag, puts his fingers in her vagina, finds that she is wet and says to her, feel this, Anastasia. Your body's soaking just for me. Right. See how, See how much, much your body, body likes this. Likes this. Likes this. See how much your body likes this, Anastasia. Yeah. So you're, And I want it to say. Yeah. I want the next it. version to say, <laughs> See how sexually relevant your body finds this. Which tells me very little about whether you wanted or liked it. <laughs> Did you want it or like it? No. Double crap. Double crap is a thing they say a lot. Too. <laughs> Let me say that I am a romance reader. I read it with an open mind. It wasn't for me. 
I value a lot of things that Fifty Shades did for opening up a conversation about erotica and sexuality for women. And it also sold many millions of copies and perpetuated this myth, the genital response. Because here's the really bad thing about the book, about this particular aspect of it is that even though she in an email goes on to describe the feeling of being debased, degraded, and abused, still, because he said your genitals responded, feel how much you like this, she believes him instead of believing what her own internal experience was telling her. Because isn't that we all what we all get taught, is to believe other people's opinions about our bodies, what they are and what they should be, more than we trust and believe what our bodies are trying to tell us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that theme runs throughout your book of learning how to shed the messages that you've been given and the ideas about how things should be and learning to more deeply trust what comes out of you, what what your what you know about yourself and what does give you pleasure and what doesn't and to bring that to the conversation. And I'm remembering the question you asked about, like, how do we tell what's socially constructed and what's what you actually want and like? Mm -hmm. And sort of almost everything is socially constructed. Nobody is born with any innate sexually relevant stimuli other than just plain old genital sensations. Like nobody's born being turned on by cars or high heeled shoes or smoking cigarettes or power play. That's all learned from culture. That doesn't mean that it's not real for you and it's what you really do want. It just means that that is what you learned. It's what your culture taught you. And some of those things are just sexually relevant, like your brain has been taught that those are sexually relevant stimuli. And some of them are things that in the right context really do give you gigantic pleasure and you really do desire them under the in the right context, in one that facilitates pleasure. Somehow my go-to example of this has been uh, if you fantasize about being cornered by five strangers who just want you sexually and so they take you, if you're alone, safe in your bed, masturbating to that fantasy, in reality, you the context is you are 100% safe and in control of that. Whereas if in reality, five strangers cornered you and wanted to have you sexually, that would be physically unsafe. Your stress response would kick in. You would only want to get away, wouldn't actually be sexy. And the difference is the context. You can, if you want to create that fantasy for yourself, you can ask five friends to participate in a role play and communicate really clearly about what everybody's limits are. But that's, again, a really different context from five actual strangers. Yeah. So it's important to revisit for a moment when you were describing context at the beginning, you were talking about all the factors that shape context. So it's not just like, oh, well... You know, the context is, um, you know, the bedroom's messy and the kids are knocking at the door. So I'm going to, you know, send the kids to grandma's and clean the bedroom. There's like more than just the physical context. There's yeah, all of the that. The stuff in the here and now tends to be the easy stuff to fix, the easy stuff to address. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I heard someone joking at a romance writer's conference, characters in romance novels have sex when they're being like chased and shot at by the mafia, and I can't have sex if there's still a dish in the sink. <laughs> that's, that's the easy stuff. The difficult stuff is when what you're bringing to bed and bringing to the context is years of shame or years of judgment and blame or relationship conflict or um, a trauma history or body shame or gendered roles and ideas about how sex is supposed to work. And if it's not working that way, then it's working wrong. Those are longer term projects. And most of them can be undone through simple daily mindfulness practices. It does take time in the same way it it took time to get you to this place. It takes time to shift you out of that place and into a different, more neutral, self-accepting, partner-accepting place. But noticing the gunk, as I call it, the gunk that gets in the pipes and making a decision to consider the possibility that you could live without the gunk and maybe clean it out is 
the way to clear up the channels so that when you get to bed, the context is not one that's bringing with it all of this historical shit. Yes. I've been swearing a lot. I you don't have. know if that's okay. It's, this Sorry. is an explicit show. It's totally fine. Oh, good. I'm wondering if before we go, since you just brought up mindfulness, if you could offer just a simple approach to how you've seen mindfulness work. Like what's something that someone can do that over time will affect that great kind of change? Mm-hmm. The simplest version is simply, so when you're in the process of a sexual experience, you will notice that maybe body critical thoughts or sexuality critical thoughts or partner critical thoughts will enter your mind. You just notice them and are like, oh, hey, there's that, there's that critical thought. I'm going to have that critical thought literally any other time that I want for the moment. I'm going to put it in the back and I'm going to return my attention to the pleasurable sensations happening in my body. And another critical thought will float through your mind. You'll be like, oh, hey, look, there's another critical thought. I'm just temporarily, I'm going to put that in the back and I'm going to return my attention to the pleasurable sensations happening in my body. And with practice over and over, we become really skilled at noticing those emotions before they dig deep and even reducing the frequency intensity with which they float into our minds. It makes a tremendous, there's a huge body of research. Another person for you to interview, Lori Brado, does all this research on the impact of mindfulness on women's sexual well-being, especially women who are in recovery from gynecological cancers and breast cancers and other diseases, uh, the impact it has on their relationships and their sexuality and how to use mindfulness and sex education as a way to maximize sexual well-being in the recovery process. Amazing. Amazing. And I, I loved how you brought that in your book as well, not only um, in how you just described, but also in talking about how important it is to see the ways that you do judge yourself and you're critical of yourself and how all of those um, responses are turning your stress inward, like you're creating more stress for yourself, which is putting the brakes on for yourself and gets you in that negative feedback loop versus being takes, able to heal it through your mindfulness. Yeah, go ahead. It it requires the decision to prioritize turning off the brakes. You have to decide that it matters to you and to your relationship that you access your own sexual well-being. The couples who what we learn in John Gottman's research is that the couples who sustain strong sexual connections over multiple decades are not couples who hot and heavy can't wait to stuff their tongue down each other's throat all the time. They are the couples who one have a strong foundation of friendship for their relationship and two prioritize sex. So they decide that it matters for their relationship that they set aside this you know, half hour when they stop dealing with the kids and work and family and friends and Game of Thrones and all the other things that they could be paying attention to. They stop all that and they just pay attention to each other in this, frankly, pretty silly, fun way that humans do because it matters for their relationship that they have that time to play and touch and connect It's not the case for every couple that connecting in this way matters for their relationship. But the couples who sustain strong sexual connections, it's what they do. They make the decision that it matters, that they cultivate sexual pleasure and curiosity. Well, you're blessing us with a great way to end our conversation while at the same time reminding me of all the things that we could have (laughs) talked about. Um, I just want to say... desire. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Well, read chapter seven. That's all. Just read chapter seven. They know but, enough for that to make sense now. Do you have time to give a quick blip on that before before we go? Okay, really quick. Okay. Yes. So, my goodness. Uh, the standard party line about desire is that it's spontaneous. It just sort of comes out of the... You're walking down the street, you're eating lunch, and uh, Erica Moen, who's the cartoonist who illustrated Come As You Are, she draws this as a lightning bolt to the genitals, just... Kaboom! You just want the sexes. And so you go to your partner with, I have the kaboom. Can I have the sexes? Uh, And your partner's like, 
So that is absolutely one healthy, normal way to experience sexual desire is to have it just be feel spontaneous and kind of out of the blue. And there is another totally healthy, normal way to experience sexual desire is called responsive desire. See, spontaneous desire emerges in anticipation of pleasure. Responsive desire emerges in response to pleasure. Bearing in mind that pleasure is con- is sensitive to context and not simple. Uh, so the way this works, there's really sort of two narratives of how it works. One is the sort of cuddle snuggle narrative where you're just like sitting on the couch watching Netflix and your partner comes over and starts touching you and your body's like, Oh, that feels really nice. And your partner starts doing like other more interesting things and you turn and maybe start kissing on your partner and your brain receives all the stimulation is like, Oh, it feels that feels really nice. And you just, like turn and do maybe some more things. And there's a hand that goes up a shirt and your brain's like, that's, you know what, how about the sexy times, right? So it's kaboom that emerges in response to pleasure, the cuddle snuggle model. And then there's the Liz Lemon, let's do this model where, you know, <laughs> you dump the toys in the toy box. It's three o'clock on Saturday afternoon. You said that you would, you, me in the red underwear, here we go. Let's just Get in the bed and go. (laughs) And you put your body in the bed and you put your skin against your partner's skin and you remember that you like this. You like this person. You enjoy these sensations and you allow your body to remember that this is fun and good. That's responsive desire. And all three of those are 100% normal, normal, healthy ways, right? That's many people feel that if you have to set appointments, if you don't already like crave it when you get in bed, then there's something wrong. Nope. That's how it works sometimes. Most people will experience all of these different kinds of desire in their life. Some people never experience spontaneous desire. Some people have no experience of responsive desire. What matters is that you just notice that there are differences and there are changes and they are all 100% normal. And you can maximize responsive desire. The main way to maximize responsive desire is not to judge or shame it, but simply allow it. You allow desire to emerge from pleasure. My three word, it rhymes in everything so you can remember it and tell your friends is pleasure is the measure. Pleasure is the measure of sexual well-being. It's not how much you crave it. It's not how often you do it or where you do it or what you do or how many people or even how many orgasms you have. It's whether or not you like the sex you are having. Mm. There's this sex therapist in New Jersey named Christine Hyde who uses this party metaphor. She says to her clients, if you're invited to a party by your best friend, of course you say yes, because it's your best friend and it's a party. But then as the date approaches, you start thinking, oh, there's going to be all this traffic. We got to find childcare. Do I really want to put on pants on a Friday? (laughs) But like you go because you said you would and it's your best friend and it's a party. And what happens? Most of the time you have a good time at the party. If you are having fun at the party, you are doing it right. Pleasure mm. is the measure mm. of sexual well-being. Mm. Yeah. And just as a quick addendum, I, because I love how you suggest this in your book, and it's something we've talked about on the show before, sometimes in that context, taking sex off the table or making it okay to that this isn't leading to sex, this is just about exploring pleasure, mm-hmm. that can, I think, that's one of those it things that takes the, the, bre- the brakes demand. off. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So I have actually started recommending that couples, when they, if they set an appointment, they set a date uh, of like, you know, Saturday at three o'clock, you and me, we're going to do something. They uh, set very firm limits on what they're allowed to do. Yeah. Sometimes it means not actually touching each other. Sometimes distance is, and this is the reason why uh, I find both Esther Perel's model and John Gottman's model to be helpful because people vary a lot in what works for them. Some people like crave the closeness in order to facilitate desire. And some people really long to have distance to sort of have a bridge to cross to move toward their partner. People just have different strategies in the same way our breaks and gas are different. Um, So figuring out what to do in that chunk of time that you set aside for you and your partner to do something or other that feels good is going to be different for you versus from everybody else that you know. Mm, Yeah. So take the time to get to know yourself and what you might actually want 
in that circumstance. Yeah. Right. Oh, so many things. And yet mm-hmm. I, we have run out of time. Emily Nagoski, it is so great to chat with you. I think your book, Come As You Are, is really required reading for people to just come to understand themselves as sexual beings in a totally new, actually based on science and not based on fable way. And uh, especially if you're a woman, especially if you're in a relationship with a woman, and even if you're a man and not in a relationship with a woman, there's just so much in here that that I think and will help you. people too. Yes, and anyone, wherever you are on the spectrum, this will help you come to understand yourself and how that all works within you. So um, I'm so appreciative of your contribution through writing the book. And um, if people want to find out more about you, where can they find you on the interwebs? Oh, the main place to go is my website, which is just emilynagoski.com. Great. And we will have a link to that along with a detailed show guide if you visit neilsatin.com slash normal. Um, though I'm tempted to make it pleasure is the measure. But neilsatin.com <laughs> slash normal. Or you can text the word passion to the number 33444 and follow the instructions. Emily Nagoski, thanks so much. Hope to have you back again sometime. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to another episode of Relationship Alive. If you like what you've heard and want to make it easier for other people to find out about us, please take a moment to subscribe to our podcast and to rate and review us on iTunes. If you have questions or comments or want to continue the conversation, you can always join our Relationship Alive community Facebook group. And for more information about today's episode, visit us online at neilsatin.com slash podcast. Or you can always text the word passion, P-A-S-S-I-O-N, to the number 33444 for more information. Finally, do you have a burning question that you're hoping we can have answered here on Relationship Alive, either for a future or past guest? Let me know and I'll see what I can do. Take care and see you next time.